as for budget for content, to be honest, our company is doing quite well where we don't need to think about the budgets. So we don't have like annual budgets pretty much for anything. We're just spending money. And if I spend money too much somewhere, uh, my CEO would just message me on Slack and say like, Tim, are you out of your mind spending this kind of money there? (laughs) But we don't agree on any marketing budgets up front. Uh, and this is what makes my work exciting. This is Super Fast Business with James Schramko. James Helping you build your business super fast. 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 James Schramko here. Welcome back to superfastbusiness.com. This is episode 717. And I have with me Tim Solo from HRFs. Welcome. Hey, James, thanks a lot for having me. It's my absolute pleasure. Uh, I should start out by saying that your name and the name of the business you represent are spelt differently than what they sound. Uh, so <laughs> it uh, looks like Solo, but it's pronounced Solo for your surname. And of course, HREFs, a lot of people would probably call AHREFs unless they've been educated yeah. like I have been recently. Uh, and what an amazing story you've got. We're going to be talking about marketing today. In particular, I'm keen to know how you started out with HREFs when it was small and you filled yourself into a role that would be represented uh, as a CMO, I guess. And I'd love to know what that journey looked like and also along the way how you grew the business because I know you've specialized in content marketing in particular. And it would be great if we start out, perhaps get a sense of the size of HREFs because I think a lot of people might be surprised about that. We, we probably use the tool. We have a subscription to it, so we've been funding it for sure. And uh, <laughs> with a long history in SEO, uh, we've come to rely upon that tool and use it to tune our own site. And we used to use it for our client sites. But how big is HREFs? Uh, yeah, so in terms of headcount, we are uh, in the ballpark of 50 people. But that's not because we are like thrifty or something. It's just because it's the position of our CEO and founder, Dmitry, who doesn't want the headcount of his company to go like beyond 50 people. So he likes to stay small. Because he thinks that uh, this uh, makes us avoid some bureaucracy, some politics, uh, and just like we stay lean. So in terms of headcount, it's like 50 people. And in terms of uh, annual recurring revenue in 2018, like we don't share our numbers uh, publicly, really. But in 2018, our CEO himself tweeted that we have surpassed 40 million in annual recurring revenue with a growth rate of about 50% year over year. So that was 2018. Now we're 2020. So you can like do the math uh, of where we are right now. Well, thank you for sharing that. And it's a huge and staggering number for a team of that size. A lot of software as a service companies like to report on everything that goes on in their business. Some of the founders like to, they use it as a growth strategy almost. I'm wondering, yeah. Why the difference in the position? Uh, and by the way, I'm the same as you guys. Like I'm pretty private. I don't feel compelled to share revenue reports and everything that I'm doing because I still believe in trade secrets and having an advantage. And I think that's what a lot of people actually pay me to help them with is to do things <laughs> behind the scenes with their business that are going to help them have an advantage over their competitors without publishing a playbook. But is that the same reason or you got a different reason? Maybe we just don't want to be primarily known for like how much money we're making, uh, but mostly for the product. But at the same time, because we're operating in uh, MarTech industry, marketing tech, we are marketing ourselves. Yes. And we want to be an example of like an efficient company of the company that doesn't follow all those like uh, SaaS playbooks, growth playbooks and does things our way. So we don't have sales, we don't generate leads, we don't have CRMs and all that stuff. We don't have funding, we're bootstrapped. So we do a lot of things differently. And because like uh, one of the positions of our CEO and founder Dmitry is that he other than just growing the company, he also wants to help other bootstrappers. So this is why we still have to share our message. And for some credibility, we still need to share uh, our numbers, our progress now and then so that people would know that uh, we have something to back it up. We're not just talking, we also growing our company this way and it is working. Right. And I'm not saying it's the same, but it does remind me 
of the positioning of base camp. Those guys are a little bit contrarian and they like to zig when everyone else sags. And uh, they do publish thoughts and they have scrapped a lot of bureaucracy as well. So I really get behind that. I've had a strong influence from the Ricardo Semler style of business with our own team where we, we don't have hours or work days or any of that stuff. We have a very different culture than most. Now, I can yeah, detect you, you, a, a slight accent you've got there. <laughs> Where's that coming from? Uh, how slight is slight? I think Put it's it like, this way. Uh, <laughs> it's to the extent where I'm going to mention that at uh, superfastbusiness.com, we do publish the full transcript at episode 717. <laughs> so if we say anything uh, between my Australian accent and Tim's nice, strong <laughs> accent, if there's a brain in. Right. If the Ukrainian accent is pretty strong. So you can go and read the transcript if you want to catch some of it. Cause I plan to get some gold from Tim today because there's got to be a story behind this growth because you were there from the yeah. early days, weren't you, Tim? Not like from the very early days, but let's say I was from the days that uh, HRF started to, to care about their marketing. So right. Dmitry found me at a time where he understood that his product and the technical side of things, the development side of things was stellar. So he had a great product on his hands, but he needed to uh, build a marketing department that he was looking for a person who would be like the first person to hire and who would start building that, that marketing side of things. So this is when I joined the company and it was five years ago, essentially, it was 2015. And like the story of how Dmitry found me is somewhat interesting in itself because I never hid the fact that I'm from Ukraine. So like now we're talking and people can clearly get from my accent that uh, I'm not a native English speaker. But when I write articles, it's hard for people to notice where I'm from. And a lot of people think I'm from the US or the UK unless I like make some stupid statements. Anyway, so I was never hiding the fact that I'm from Ukraine. But at the same time, I was doing some marketing work and was writing some articles at different blogs in English. So this is how Dmitry noticed me. He saw some of my work on different marketing blogs. And then he found out that I'm from Ukraine, which is where he's from. So this created some kind of a bond because he himself usually speaks Russian. So he thought that it would be quite convenient to have uh, a marketing person who he could talk to in his native language to properly explain himself. But then that marketing person could do uh, the marketing stuff in English. So I think this was one of the factors of how Dmitry hired me. Yeah, and this is quite an interesting story. It is interesting. And I could tell from your Twitter that you have Eastern European style. You've got this black and white, yes, no, on, off approach that is <laughs> a unique flavor for that area of the world. But yeah. I have seen YouTube videos with other characters uh, presenting information on the product. Like you've got other talent within your content team these days, yeah. right? Producing stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's one of the few you email want- newsletters that I actually provide my students as a benchmark of some of the industry's best newsletters like there's very few email newsletters that i would actually subscribe to because they're annoying or or pitchy Uh, i like the one from hrefs very much it reminded me of the ones i was getting from wistia which were high quality and educational but there's very few companies who are actually doing that you know a lot of people are are not approaching it the same way and often you're sending people to youtube editorial you know it's like content that is helping people regardless of what tool or platform it's sort of like giving them good ideas and techniques and if they happen to use the tool then that's great and i'm sure it drives sales and growth but it's the kind of subscription that someone would opt in for because you know you're making it better off i wonder was that uh, very deliberate yeah we're putting a lot of effort in our content and speaking of our youtube channel I'm actually now waiting for the silver YouTube button to arrive because we surpassed 100,000 YouTube subscribers. Thank you. And like, I should also mention that it's all natural. So I know quite a few people in different industries, not just uh, marketing. They can just go and buy YouTube subscribers to inflate their channels and like look like they're bigger than they are. But when you compare the number of subscribers that they have to the number of views on their like latest published videos, you can quickly see that a lot of those subscribers are fake. So luckily we never tried to buy any subscribers or anything like that. So uh, it's all natural and I'm waiting for the silver button. Back to the content. Thanks a lot for uh, your kind words about our content. Yeah, so like I said, we don't have sales team. 
And when you read like different marketing books and books on how to sell, I once uh, had an amazing advice that stuck with me. It read something like this. The first time people use your product is in their heads. So in your marketing, in your marketing materials, in your marketing communications, you have to make people see themselves using your product. And I think content is amazing uh, way to get it done. So in our content, we try to teach people to solve their problems with the help of our product. So whatever article you would read from Ahrefs or whatever video you would watch from Ahrefs, we would try to help you with your problems, but we would also show you how our product is helping you. So I think this is how we're able to grow our company to where we are right now without having a lot of headcount, without having salespeople. We don't even have paid acquisition. So a lot of SaaS companies, uh, when you talk about their marketing, they would sooner or later mention paid acquisition, like how much does it cost you to acquire a lead? What's the customer acquisition cost? What's the uh, LTV lifetime value of a customer? Ask me what's the customer acquisition cost or lifetime value. I say, I don't know because I don't care. We get customers for free because we create all this content because that content ranks in Google thanks to SEO. We get I think our blog right now gets 350,000 visitors per month, right. every single month. Excellent. 350,000 visitors from Google. Guess how many people is that every single month? And those people are being educated on, on our product. So these are free leads. We don't pay for leads. This is why we don't need to care about... You must have a content budget, them. right? Paying content creators or team members. Do you, do you have in-house or contractors? Yeah, we have. Uh, we try to keep all our marketing in-house because mm -hmm. in the course of my marketing career and my attempts to build our marketing department, quite a few times I tried to employ agencies, freelancers for different things, for content, for writing articles, for running our ads, pretty much name like for social media marketing, name any marketing task. And I try to work with freelancers or agencies on it. And what I figured out is that no freelancer or no agency would care about your business as much as you do. Yeah. And as much as people who belong to the business, who uh, have that connection with the business. So right now we're trying to keep everything in house. And yeah, as for budget for content, to be honest, our company is doing quite well where we don't need to think about the budgets. So we don't have like annual budgets pretty much for anything. We're just spending money. And if I spend money too much somewhere, my CEO would just message me on Slack and say, like, Tim, are you out of your mind spending this kind of money there? <laughs> but we don't agree on any marketing budgets up front. Uh, and this is what makes my work exciting. Oh, I think it's great. I, I love it. I can really resonate with this. I went for the longest time without tracking things like you talk about. I still don't have a, a particular funnel or a, a free plus shipping book offer or the, the usual sort of direct <laughs> response stuff that I think is, I mean, it's it's a bit vomit worthy in a way, you know, these big yeah. typical mates launches and stuff like that. I don't like it. So luckily for me, I got into podcasting earlier. That's been my prime channel and obviously we're up to episode 717 probably proof that you don't necessarily have to get better at something by doing more of it but you just have to get in early. yeah <laughs> now one of the things that you have lent some of your budget to which i'm very grateful for is you've taken a sponsorship of super fast business live 2020 so i'm looking forward to meeting you in person and hearing yeah. some of your seo content marketing tips at that event so that's going to be amazing and I loved your motivation for coming. The reason you wanted to do it is just to come and meet people and create great relationships. And that's very heart-centered, long-term thinking compared to your average person. And I think that's to be commended. Same as when I ask, you know, what you'd like to talk about on this particular show, because that's a courtesy most podcasters will offer you. And you said, let's tell people about our YouTube channel that they can educate themselves about. I mean, that, that's the right thing. So I noticed you've got a, a mug there for anyone watching a video of this. <laughs> got a, a sponsored mug there. So getting that promo shot in there, I'm sure that was unintentional. <laughs> Whereabouts is your team located, Tim? So the headquarters of Hrefs are here in Singapore, where I met right now. And this is why I don't have any problems of syncing time with you, time zones. Yeah. Uh, you're in Australia, That's I'm great. in Singapore, so it works perfectly. Not as much when I need to record a podcast with someone from the US. That's terrible. 
So yeah, uh, here we have our head office and we have, I'd say, 40% of all our employees here in our office. The other 60% are scattered around the globe and they are pretty much working remotely. So they are remote employees, but they are in-house employees. Yeah. Nice. It's a good sort of load balance scenario. You've got the ability to take advantage of different geo localities and, and cultures and specialties without them having to be in one particular place. But you also get that amazing ability to have hyper communication. And, you know, when you've got a good core of people there together, things can happen much easier when you can walk over and have a, yeah. you know, have a meal with someone. And yeah. That's why I meet my and team also- all the time and why we run live events. I think bringing people face to face is not something you can substitute. Do you bring all your people together occasionally in the business? Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. We have the kind of program travel to Singapore. Uh, So every employee that joins the company, uh, once a year, they have a paid trip paid by the company with a two week stay in Singapore, also paid by the company, where they would come like and work from our office and uh, hang out with our team. And actually, we just got back from a company retreat in France, we were skiing and the company also rented a hotel for all stuff. And most people even brought their families. So there were a lot of HRS people there. So yeah, we do understand the value of people being like physically together and hanging out and studying each other's personalities and bonding uh, and all that. Well, you know, one thing I love about Singapore is it's just four hours away from the Maldives. So if you want to want to rent a great boat there, it's just a four hour trip and you can have a beautiful liverboard experience in the best surfing conditions in the world. Uh, So I'm frequently heading through Singapore for that. Um, Oh, okay. Look, I can't ignore this YouTube achievement of 100,000 subscribers. If you had to strain it down to just a few sentences, because I've heard YouTube a lot in the last few weeks. I was speaking to Pat Flynn this morning. He's chasing (laughs) YouTube this year. He's got a couple of 100,000 subscribers. He's keen on it. Another one of uh, my students, Scott, has a bass guitar channel. He's just absolutely killing it. Another one I've coached has almost a million YouTube subscribers. And I've heard from my lead gen experts, the people who are fantastic on Facebook ads, the new frontier is YouTube. That's the place where you get the cheapest, best traffic right now compared to anywhere else. And it's they're hot. So what can I do to improve my channel? I think we've just cracked 4,000 subscribers. So we're, we're 4% of the way there to my silver button. What sort of things would you advise my content team to pay attention to? So two things you need to know about Ahrefs YouTube channel. First of all, we are operating in the niche of SEO. And I would say it's quite narrow. For example, if you compare it to travel or even motivation. So like uh, Mm. Gary V, his audience is much broader uh, than our audience, which is SEO. So this is the first thing which makes it tough for us to grow our channel. So the first thing that would set your expectations is the audience, the size of the audience that you can potentially target on YouTube. And the second thing is kind of your resources. So I would uh, I would explain it that for us, our channel growth and our channel, the quality of our content was a very gradual process. So I started our YouTube channel five years ago when I just joined HRFs and I was practically shooting myself on the on the iPhone. I know it uh, sounds like a story like any person who reached a a certain level of success would say I was living on a couch and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But I was literally shooting myself on my iPhone and I was just putting out some ugly screencast videos. So if you go to HRF's YouTube channel and you sort by oldest, you'll see those ugly videos. They were terrible. And at the same time, I hired my friend in Ukraine who I knew had very basic skills of video animation. But I told him, hey, like my videos are terrible. My accent was like five times more terrible than it is today. So I told him, no worries. Your animation skills are terrible. My video skills are terrible. Let's work together and see if we can improve. And this was a gradual process. So my video animation guy was getting more skills and was able to do better animations. I was progressing with like my camera gear. So I upgraded to GoPro. Then I like bought a more fancy camera. Then I bought like a microphone. Then I bought some lights. So it was very gradual. But Even like if you do that with our channel, if you go to our channel and look up our uh, first published videos, some of them have like tens 
tens of thousands of views on them, even though the quality is terrible. Yeah. Uh, and right now, I found a great guy from Canada who took over our channel. And like, while YouTube channel was one of my responsibilities because I had to like do all sorts of marketing for HRS back when uh, I was like a single person operation. But right now, as we have like uh, team members and uh, each of them is responsible for their own channel. So that guy, he's creating content, he's shooting himself on camera, he's creating scripts, but then he also have a designer who is helping him with to create great thumbnails. So again, I would pat ourselves on the back on the quality of our YouTube thumbnails. And this is very important because this is how you get clicks uh, on YouTube whenever your videos show up as relevant. Also, our video animation guy in those five years, he got to a pretty decent level. So the animations he's doing, sometimes I, I'm just like super impressed by what he's doing. And finally, we also have like an editor who also like minimizes the time that uh, our video guy spends on creating the video. He adds like all sorts of different things, cuts, like uh, call outs and blah, blah, blah. So right now it's three people uh, working on each of our episodes and we do one per week. So there's actually a lot of work. So our secret to a uh, quote unquote success on YouTube if 100,000 subscribers could be called uh, a success is gradual improvement. So we were gradually looking for things to improve and it paid off. Fantastic. That's very useful. Now, I want to shift over to your role as CMO. You weren't always the CMO. You were the marketing department in the early days, right? You were the <laughs> one guy. And I know a lot of people listening to this, they have a team or a small team, like one or two VAs. They have a strong vision. They're good at what they do. But where they get stuck is they just wish, gosh, if someone could just come in here and drive this marketing for me, like, why do I always have to make every decision? Why do I have to follow everything? God, should I be doing many chat bots? Should I be doing a podcast? Should I make videos? Should I build my YouTube channel? Uh, what about content marketing? Yes, like, it just gets overwhelming. How do they get someone like you? And what did you do? How did you architect your gradual rise from the guy to the leader of the team and orchestrating a team? Like, what are the moves for someone to make from the early days on? This is an amazing question. And uh, I feel you, you should better ask this question to our CEO because he's the one who hired me. So he had some criteria uh, other than like that we speak Russian, both of us. Uh, he had some criteria that he thought was like uh, promising. Uh, but yeah, also in terms of how I was building marketing, it was also like heavily influenced by our CEO. So the thing is, I still remember like in the first year, essentially in the first months when I joined the company, when you join, you're giving some kind of KPIs. Like what are the expectations from your role? Like what are they going to pay you for? So I still remember that uh, Dmitry told me that right now we have like 6,000 customers at Ahrefs. How do we make it like 16 by the end of this year? So this was the only KPI he gave me. And even then, that KPI wasn't like carved in stone because some methods of uh, customer acquisition are like, again, a number of customers is just number of customers. How do we get from... 6,000 to 16,000, let's drop our prices to $10 per month. and We'll get like 16,000. So it's all like kind of arbitrary. So at the end of the day, like five years later, I don't have any KPIs that my CEO would measure me for. So he doesn't even look at annual recurring revenue because then again, we could do some tricky things to squeeze more money out of our customers, but we don't want to do this because it can come at the cost of our reputation. So to answer your question, how does uh, a business owner uh, find a CMO for themselves? I guess it, the answer is just like you hire pretty much anyone else. You look for cultural fit because that person should kind of share the same values as you are because it's your company, it's your vision. And that person would like the marketing person only transmits your vision and your product further to the world. So if you see that you have the same values with that person and if you see that another good trigger, uh, another good thing that I would look for is that before joining HRFs, I was starting to bootstrap my own business. And I think the experience of trying to grow my own business 
from nothing to some revenue and hiring my own people and reinvesting my own profits uh, and splitting my profits, uh, splitting my uh, reinvestments into marketing, into develop, in, into further development of the product, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It gives me a better idea of how marketing fits the entire picture of the business. I think this is invaluable because before that, as I was working in different marketing positions, I could only see part of the picture. And this makes you a different kind of marketer. So I would look for two things. First, did that person ever try to kickstart something completely on their own? And how far did they get with this? And secondly, do they share the same values that you have? Uh, Do they like your product? Do they seem like a good fit for your product? I guess it leads to the natural question, you know, how does someone like Dimitri retain someone like Tim for the long term? Like, what would you need to help a CMO with for them to stay with you and to continue that mission beyond the first phase? Because I nat- naturally in this entrepreneurial space, people think, oh, well, I've, you know, I've built this thing and like you're actually, you know, very respectful and loyal of, of the owner. That can't be said of all two ICs or CMOs uh, where they're going to, you know, I call it the Western way, but at some point there's a bit of an itch that they feel like they might want to scratch and do their own thing, you know, leaving a bit of a gap. So I guess a couple of questions there. Do you make sure that people can come up behind you if you did want to do that? And what do they do to make sure you stay there anyway if that is something you want to do? Yeah, so uh, there are lots of, uh, good books on what drives people, on like how to motivate people, how to make them loyal. And like the first thing that, that comes to mind is, of course, compensation. And uh, it's not just compensation in terms of its size, but your ability to influence uh, the size of your compensation. So if you feel you have control over your compensation, if you feel that as you're growing as a professional, as you're bringing more and more value to the business, you get like equal amount of compensation. That is a good sign. But there's also like quite a few psychological studies that say that at a certain point, compensation no longer plays a role. Another like couple thousand dollars doesn't change anything in your lifestyle. So you no longer care. Uh, So how do you retain people at this point? In my case, what I like about HRFs and what I like about working with Dmitry is that he gives me a lot of freedom. So, like I said, we don't have meetings. I don't have any KPIs that he would kind of impose on me. There, there's no expectation uh, that Dmitry would have uh, from me other than expecting me to just do the best work I, I could do. And I'm free to pursue whatever projects I want to pursue. So uh, if I want to connect with you and go to your conference and talk to the people there, if I want to spend my time doing this, Dmitry trusts me that this is a good use of my time and it would be essentially good for the company. This is what I love about working at HRF, that I don't have to ask permission for every single decision I make. So essentially, I think I'm essentially an entrepreneurial type. And the way that Dmitry, quote unquote, manages me is he's letting my entrepreneurial character kind of thrive in that environment. Yeah, I think you sound like a classic entrepreneur. You're (laughs) an entrepreneur within the company of someone else, but you've got all the same sort of benefits and upside and uh, no doubt you're guaranteed a profit. Like you can't really lose money like the founder or the owner might get sideswiped at some point. Employees uh, or contractors, whatever way they're set up, they're almost always guaranteed a profit. And if you've got that level of freedom, that's fantastic. And, you know, the true story behind how you ended up being involved with my event was I approached only one or two people whose tools we actually use. And we had an SEO business for seven years and Ahrefs is the only subscription we have for SEO now. We had every single tool. I can tell you we had every tool because we were we had hundreds of clients who were generating lots of audits and reports and tracking and everything. After we sold that business, we're like, okay, what tool do we want to use for ourselves, for our own business? And that's the one that survives. So I only want to bring things to my audience that represent value. So you've done a tremendous job of reflecting the high quality values across. And obviously the market's rewarding that by subscribing to your content and the the revenue figures, et cetera. 
Uh, so it's all very happy. What are you excited about when it comes to this year? We're recording this earlier on in, in 2020. What do you look forward to this year? Obviously, aside from Super Fast Business Live, because that's a given. <laughs> but what sort of initiatives do you think are going to capture your attention? Ah, uh, This is a good question. So this year, we're actually working on a book. And I think the, you recommended me a person oh, that absolutely, would, yeah, it was yeah. you. Um, book is <laughs> so, transformational. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I read your book and I was like super excited uh, and uh, blown away by the quality of it. By like it's quite thin mm. and the amount like signal to noise ratio is like amazing. Uh, I've read, I think I've read more than forty books last year, and a fair share of them is just fluff. Yeah. So I was pretty amazed at how good your book was. So I asked like uh, to connect me with the person, uh, like with the editor who I can work with yeah. who could help me. Well, like, more than even editing, she, you know, Kelly put that book together for me. She got it out of me. It's like yeah. it was in me, but I have so much stuff. I've, I've been prolifically creating stuff for so long and I needed help to organize it, structure it and make it tight. And she had all the best resources and that book would not have happened without her. In fact, it didn't happen for five years prior since I tried to do a book. So that was a pivot point. And, you know, speaking of, of going for delivering the quality over the short-term plays, you know, the book plus shipping and all that sort of hoopla, the book is now selling better two years later upon release than it, when, when it came out. I really think it's going to be a creeper like Influence by Cialdini. That thing mm. didn't take off for years after it was published. And then it yeah. took to market. I wanted a book that I could hang my hat on and say, I'm proud of this and I dedicated it to my kids. Like, kids, read <laughs> this because I, you know, it took me a lot of time and energy to figure this stuff out. So I appreciate the kind words and I think you'll the, – the book is a huge cornerstone for marketing, positioning and authority and education, which obviously your company is all about educating people. Yeah, well, in our case, our book won't be – as uh, pivotal as yours because it won't be as unique your book is essentially your story and your life lessons like your unique stuff that you're going to share in our case what we want to do is we want to create a good beginner's guide to seo that people that our customers that our fans would give their like junior seo people and they would know that hrefs is going to give you the best introduction to the world of seo that you can possibly get. So this is our goal with the book. So I don't think that book would last five years or something because things change in SEO. So sure. uh, what works today might not work like two years from now. But I think uh, creating this kind of book and giving uh, our audience, giving people who are using our tool al already a good resource that they could pass to their like junior employees would be a good marketing move for us good value move for us perfect it's a lot say. more like my second book which is more tactical and currently in progress so I, I think there's a place for that anything instructional i would like to put myself down for that book you've described i'll be giving that to my team for sure like we okay, have tool rules right we have three tool rules one is do we absolutely need this tool right that's the first line of selection the second one is if we do need it, is this the best tool of its type or breed? And we check that occasionally. And then the third rule, and this is the important one, which I think a lot of people forget, is do we actually know how to use this tool? Right? Yeah. Are we using it properly? Because I'm sure a lot of people churn or stop a subscription because they're paying for something and not using it. So I encourage my team, like, watch the tutorials. Uh, spend time, ask them their support if you've got a question uh, and you don't understand it. Get in the newsletter and keep up to date with the, the upgrades they make and the, you know, keep updating it. And this is where we can get a lot from a little by having those three tool rules. And I think this book, it really fits into that number three. Like if you gave it to everyone who's already got the tool or, or they pay for it or you get it in front of them, it's definitely going to help them solve their problems better, longer, deeper, and, and uh, remain, you know, a steadfast customer. So I think it's a really smart move, and I'm excited for you. I can see why you're excited for that. 
<laughs> it's amazing that you're bringing this up, but actually our book is a bit different. So we really want to give people introduction to SEO. Of course, we're going to plug Hrefs in there yeah. and show like how Hrefs is unique and why you should use it. But still, we want to give people a good introduction to SEO. But as for like using the tool, I absolutely like how you said, like, go watch the videos, go read the articles, because how do you know that your employees who you buying that tool for did that? How do you yeah. know they watched those and, uh, videos? And you, how do you know the, they... the CEO is not going to do it. The founder is not going to do yeah. it. They're busy doing every other thing, <laughs> making sure they're compliant, making sure they're staying in front of the market, making sure they're doing networking or whatever. Like the last thing they want to do is punch through tutorials on a on the tool that the team's using. So you you know we yeah. have a very strong education emphasis in our business we actually have core values and one of the values we have is to be ninja good in other words mm. if we're going to be in battle we might as well be damn good at it so that implies we need to stay on top of it. we've got to be sharp we've got to know how these things work and if we don't we hire in contractors and one guy we brought in to help us with seo uh, also uses your tool and uses it really well so they can have that conversation and, and sharpen up with the help of a like a sharpening stone <laughs> Yeah, so what I was alluding to is that we're actually also working on a HREF certification course. Right. So while the book would teach you like the basics SEO, like if you're completely new to this, we're also creating a course that would teach you all the ins and outs of HREFs and it would have like a very tough quiz, like a very tough exam that you have to pass to get like certified so that business owners or like people who make decision to purchase a certain tool and give it to their team would also give this certification course and see if the people using the tool can pass this course and like know the tool well know everything all the metrics how it works where the data comes from etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is another thing that i'm excited about because we'll give a tool for like business owners and marketing leaders to evaluate how good their team is at using that powerful tool that we have. It's genius. You know, I've, I just started a project this month and I put a feature request in for 10X Pro, the platform we're using for it, for the ability for us to have visibility on the user's completion of the train, like tick in the box certification achievements because our customer is the owner of the business and they're going to buy multi licenses for this for their team. And then we want to be able to send them a report and say, right, these three people have been through all of the training. These three have not started yet. And in some industries, there's actually legal requirements, certainly in uh, legal markets, accounting, financial markets, and health markets. They have to do updated training as part of their ability to stay practicing. So this is a, a great thing when you take a professional education level approach to training and making sure the tools that the business owner is buying are being used in fact it's a really funny story the the reason we have a regular event super fast business live is because in the beginning i ran one event and then my assistant at the time kerry she said to me you know why don't we offer another event for people who already came to the first event because i wanted to sell another event but i was going to go out to market and sell it to a whole new bunch of people mm -hmm. and lo and behold 50 percent of people came back and I used the professional education arguments. Like in this industry, it's not like you do one thing and you're done. Like this is, you got to stay educated forever. You need to keep coming back and refreshing or else you're, you're toast. In fact, I'd say our market moves a little quicker than some of the other markets, uh, especially the industry I came from. The automotive industry is over 100 years old. This online internet industry, it's, it's pretty new in the general scheme of things and uh, it moves quickly, right? So... You've been very helpful with giving us some tips here, some huge insights. To finish out, what are the sorts of things that you're doing on your typical roster as a CMO in the business? Like where do you spend the majority of your week, for example? Like what sort of things are you focused on? This is an amazing question because right now I feel I'm in some kind of transitioning period. Because essentially, when I when I came to HFs, I was doing everything myself. I was writing articles. I was doing research studies. I even created a 
premium course, like four hours of uh, content of videos, like quality animated videos about content marketing and blogging, the way we were growing our blog. Some of these tips I will share on your event soon. Yeah. So, yeah, I was doing a lot of things myself. There were a lot of things with my name on them. And right now, as the team was growing, as I was hiring more and more people, I started to understand the value of management and leadership and like helping people perform to the best of their ability, uh, making sure like all the connections are smooth, smooth between people, that they are not fighting for resources and all that stuff. So right now I'm actually shifting from doing stuff myself to being a leader and helping my team perform to the best of their ability. And I think this was one of the topics of your book, that the goal of the business owner or entrepreneur is to make sure that everything works without you, that everything works smoothly without you, so that you could focus on the next big thing, so that you would have open mind for like looking for new opportunities. So I think I'm exactly at that stage, and probably this is one of the reasons your book resonated with me so much. It was very timely as I'm going through this exact period right now. I'm I'm doing less of the work myself, but I'm looking for ways to optimize my team and looking like what's the next thing we can do, what's the next thing we can do. That's fantastic. It's like you're a high performance Formula One team and you can actually focus on innovation and, and making it all run smoothly and tightly rather than being sort of stuck in there getting overwhelmed. And it's amazing how time seems to slow down. You've got ample time to do things. You can anticipate stuff. You get less surprises. The performance of everyone lifts. Everyone's calm and confident and feeling successful. And that's a great way to end up. I'm looking forward to your presentation, Tim. I, I thanks also <laughs> Thank for you. your, your support and the support of HRFs. You've mentioned your YouTube channel. Why don't you tell us the, the name of that channel so we can go and check out the amazing content there? Actually, right now we have two YouTube channels. Wow, <laughs> so the okay. First one is, <laughs> the first one is YouTube channel of HRFs where we basically share our SEO knowledge with uh, awesome video tutorials. So if someone needs help with their SEO, if someone needs to figure out how to do keyword research, link building, blah, 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 just open YouTube, search for HRFs, A-H-R-E-F-S, and you'll find our channel with a lot of tutorials. The, the thumbnails are amazing, so I'm sure you'll, you'll end up clicking something and watching our videos. And the second channel, I launched it last year because I think there's some kind of a gap in YouTube in terms of, I would call it CMO content. So content like for marketing leaders and specifically people who do marketing for SaaS, software as a service business. So I started a channel that is called SaaS Marketing Vlog, where I'm sharing the stuff that we're doing at marketing, some of our thought processes, some of our wins, some of our failures. I'm, I'm trying to publish a video every two weeks. But like I said, because these days I don't have much time to work on my stuff so much, I end up publishing a video once per month. So, but yeah, I'm trying to, to make every video high quality and super valuable. I'm going to head over so, there yeah, and sub HRF subscribe. YouTube channel that. and SaaS Marketing Vlog YouTube channel. I'll look them up. Love it. Well, YouTube's in my crosshairs now, so I'm going to go and learn from the master. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim, and I'll catch up with you shortly at the uh, live event. Thanks a lot, James. If you enjoyed this episode, episode 717, head over to superfastbusiness.com and share it with someone who could get some value from it. We've really covered a great range of content marketing and CMO stuff and a little bit of a success story, a glimpse behind the scenes from HREFs and the tremendous growth they've had and it's little wonder why. Uh, that's it for now. I'll catch you on the next episode. Discover how to build your business super fast. Check out superfastbusiness.com.